Thanks to Raycon for sponsoring today's video. I doubt Sonic could rock Raycons, probably fall off his ears or stick them on his temples, the idiot, but that doesn't mean you can't wear them like Raycons everyday earbuds. They're super comfortable to wear thanks to their optimized gel tips fitting whatever shape your ears take and they ensure they ain't falling off your ears anytime soon. And with over 8 hours of playtime, 32 hour total battery life thanks to the rechargeable carrying case starting at about half the price of other premium audio brands, the everyday earbuds have over 48,000 5 star reviews for a reason, and why as always they're my go to choice for workout and yoga sessions, haha <laughs> everything hurts. And Raycon is offering all my viewers a great deal, so click the link in the description below or go to buyraycon.com slash so call me johnny to save 15% off your next Raycon purchase. These sponsors really do help this channel and it wouldn't be possible if it weren't for your guys continued support so as always, thank you. But let's talk about Sonic now. And here we are with another movie review. I know the only other time I've done this uh, kind of format was what the first Sonic movie released in 2020, you know, before the whole world ended and all that. And I want to keep doing these, but I think for the time, I think I'm going to keep it strictly to video game movies. So I, I probably won't even go back to this format until that Mario movie comes out, whenever the hell that's supposed to be. But what a time that first Sonic movie was. The movie turned out good. It made a shitload of money. I even got the opportunity to talk about it with Justin Silverman and James Rolfe over on Cinemassacre. Like, the main inspiration for this channel and that was a trip also thanks to justin i got to listen to the entire mortal kombat soundtrack by the immortals and that shit was fire so thank you justin now despite seeing that movie twice in theaters i haven't really made it a thing to revisit it since then not even before like viewing the second movie i thought the movie was fine it was great visual effects some good jokes uh, good performances across the board but it was a little generic uh, and very predictable but nevertheless a perfectly watchable kids film it planted seeds for what I thought was going to be a more interesting sequel, the biggest one being the introduction of Tails at the uh, tail end of the film. So later on, talks of the sequel start going. We got Sonic confirmed, once again voiced by Ben Schwartz, and Colleen O'Shaughnessy, surprisingly enough, built to return as Tails, the first and hopefully not last link between the films and the video games, because Colleen has been voicing Tails since Sonic Boom back in 2014. And I think she's one of the best voices Tails has ever gotten, so that's great for her. And then it's confirmed we're getting Knuckles voiced by Idris Elba. And I gotta be honest, I'm not terribly big on casting A-list celebrities for voiceover work because more often than not, it's not about like the acting itself, it's just the, the value of the name. How much the name on the marquee can draw on tickets for the general crowd. But I love Idris Elba as an actor, so I think it helps in this case that I was already a fan of the person in question. Without getting into spoilers yet, I thought Sonic 2 was a better watch, and it was a better experience than the first film. I have some issues with it, as I'll get into it later, but overall, uh, I want to say this was a solid B+, like a really solid B+, but woe is me, I have doomed myself by giving my thoughts a grade, now I'm going to attract all those little dipshits and say, fuck you, this is an A rank, and that is why I don't do review scores anymore. I did go and see this movie twice, and I'm pretty ecstatic to say that my first viewing was over at the premiere in Los Angeles, California. Yeah, Paramount invited me and a bunch of other content creators to the LA premiere on April 5th over at the Regency Theater. Got to see a few friends, met a few fellow Sonic content creators, a couple of mutuals, the vibes were positive, and that's all I could really ask for. Um, in and out wasn't that very good though. I'd rather have White Castle. Now that's good and all, but this trip was very last minute. On top of just getting back from Philadelphia, visiting family and friends, and filming some things for that Yu-Gi-Oh video I had planned for at the end of the month, I had to pay for my flight and hotel because Paramount, the multi-million dollar movie company, did not have a travel budget. And two of those flights were canceled at the last minute. Another one ended up being delayed too. I went from Atlanta to Seattle to Los Angeles, California, then to Newark, New Jersey, and then back to Atlanta on the span of two days. So get fucked Spirit Airlines, you piece of shit service that I'm never booking again. But you know what, the view was pretty nice. Flew over the Rocky Mountains and they are gorgeous from high above, so I would recommend, under less stressful circumstances. This was a very expensive endeavor, so I gotta start making that money back. So as a reminder, I'd appreciate it if you end up liking this video, give it a like, hit subscribe, ring that bell, all that other bullshit. I could use the extra help. Thank you for showing up anyway. 
But to go deeper into things, I need to give my general thoughts on the movie. I feel that's the entire point of this video, so I'm giving the spoiler warning now. If you have not seen this movie yet, and maybe you haven't, this video is going up, and the, the movie's not even a week old yet, over here in the United States anyway. I know, like, European audience just got it, like, a week before we did, fuckers. <laughs> but still, if you have not seen this movie, stop watching this video. I'm going to be spoiling the shit out of this, and I don't want to be that guy that ruins that experience for you. So go see the movie, come back to this video. We can probably get a discussion going in the comments or on my Twitter at some call me John. All good? Give me a couple more seconds. One, two. All right, let's 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 talk Sonic the Hedgehog 2. So the movie begins where we last left off, Robotnik stranded on the mushroom planet. Despite his grim circumstance, he's made good for himself, even finding a way to make mushroom coffee using like a Rube Goldberg machine that's also made of mushrooms. I also like the little Sonic figure that runs alongside with the mushrooms getting crushed and it, and it gets crushed along with the other mushrooms. Like this dude is pissed. But we then see that Robotnik is on the verge of completing this machine that he spent God knows how long constructing that allows him to harness the power of the quill that he took from Sonic back in the first movie and send uh, what's basically a distress beacon, hoping that some poor sap picks it up and rescues the doctor. Which does happen, and out of the uh, incoming warp ring, we get these uh, humanoid warriors in, in like these bird outfits that are only a thing for this very scene for the record, and Robotnik using booby traps that are also constructed out of mushrooms. I love the ingenuity Robotnik has in this film. Um, he takes out those warriors and is about to head into the warp ring, but then Knuckles suddenly pops his head and catching Robotnik off guard. And uh, recognizing that quill that belongs to Sonic, Knuckles then asks Robotnik, hey, where did you get that? And Robotnik quickly assessing the situation that Knuckles doesn't know all the details. Uh, tells Knuckles that he'll share everything he knows with him if he can get him back to the planet Earth. Sonic's cool, by the way, completely disappears after this scene, and I don't know if that was a writing snafu. I don't recall Robotnik leaving it behind, or there was a lingering camera shot showing that he left it in the mushroom planet, or maybe it ran out of juice. No, uh, it was still glowing, even after using that distress beacon machine, so... Uh, I don't know. After this scene, it's never mentioned again, though. I, I think I might have an idea uh, where it may eventually lead to. But let's back it up a bit. Those bird warriors, I was so confused by their sudden inclusion and just as sudden exit. I was like, I'm not high, right? I didn't imagine those guys, yeah? And that's when I found out about the official prequel comic, which I did give a read after my second viewing. It's cute. I don't think it's necessary to enjoy the film. If anything, I find it more fascinating and demonstrating where the series can go as more films are eventually created. But it shows Sonic doing a superhero thing, Tails traveling through different planets and zones trying to locate Sonic and shaking off whoever's following him, Agent Stone taking over a coffee shop biding his time until Robotnik eventually returns, he gets someone framed for money laundering the dick. We also see how Knuckles became involved with those bird guys. They kidnap Knuckles and force them to fight, a la Thor and Thor Ragnarok, but he earns their respect and he gets some warp rings and that's how he finds Robotnik in the beginning of the movie. But okay, back to the movie, so we get this lovely callback to the first Sonic adventure, where Sonic's on the roof of a building in Seattle getting ready to kick it into high gear, but it's not an ancient aquatic demon he's facing, no, it's uh, it's your standard bank robbery. And Sonic does his Sonic thing in thwarting the criminals, but he's bad at it. He ends up causing like a shit ton of collateral damage, which doesn't put him in the best spotlight, and his antics end up on a newspaper, which Donut Lord, uh, Tom, James Marsden's character, uh, ends up breeding and promptly calls Sonic out for his shenanigans. He essentially, it's not quite the same, but it's pretty similar. The Uncle Ben Peter Parker talk, great power comes great responsibility and all that. But Sonic at first is like, you're not my dad. But thankfully it, it doesn't lead to some like, forced drama between the two. They reconcile pretty quickly afterwards, Sonic realizing, eh, maybe Donut Lord's got a point. And I'm thankful for that. Even with a kid's film, the last thing I needed was Sonic being on bad terms with like his foster father and shit I, ultimately don't really care about. But the human characters are not on screen for much longer, at least for now, because Donut Lord and uh, Pretzel Lady, okay, Maddie, Atika Sumter's character, are heading to Hawaii to attend Maddie's sister's wedding, getting hitched to a dude played by Shamar Moore that rocks a goatee that, I don't know if it's just me, but I kept getting reminded of that Giga Chad me, that grayscale photo with the dude with the chiseled face. I, that's all I kept thinking about whenever I looked at him. But Shamar Moore's a good looking dude. I'm like, damn. So the human characters are dropped off in Hawaii, leaving Sonic all by his lonesome for the weekend. He does what all other kids his age would do. He starts making a mess of the house. He does some extreme skateboard stuff, jumping on the bed and couch, I think referencing Home Alone. And then there's a risky business reference that the old Tom Cruise movie, do kids today even know what that movie is? I think that one was more for the, the grandparents. It's a short lived happy hour though, as Robotnik enters the scene with Knuckles and Knuckles fucking takes no time thrashing Sonic, claiming that it's his destiny to destroy him. 
But then Tails jumps in and makes the save. He fucking runs over Knuckles with a squad car that he stole earlier. Like, Knuckles was a horror movie villain. And the two make their temporary getaway. I like during the chase, Knuckles crashes through the truck that says Splash Hill on the side. I'm like, Knuckles just said fuck Sonic 4. I mean, I get it. He never had a chance to appear in those games. So, yeah, I, I totally get that. I have to admit, I am conflicted on how I feel about Idris Elba's performance as Knuckles. I couldn't pinpoint uh, the sort of dialect that Idris was trying to emulate with the character. You know, Knuckles is a, is a battle-hardened warrior raised by a warrior echidna tribe, so he's big on honor, uh, loyalty, and battle, but he's sort of literal-minded, very hot-headed, and his vocal delivery is kind of broken a few times, and I don't understand why. I think it's because I'm just used to Knuckles from the games where he has like a normal-ass accent, and it's taken me a bit to process this more uh, exotic take. He almost comes off like Drax, like Batista's Drax from Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, I think that's the best way to describe Knuckles as a character in this film and Idris Elba's performance. I wouldn't call Knuckles stupid though. Naive, yes, but not stupid. He's quite cunning and dead serious in this film, and I like that about him in this movie. You know, I like a Knuckles who just wants to punch someone's fucking face in. I think it gives him some of the best interactions with every character in this movie. Robotnik, Sonic, Agent Stone, who he calls the goat milker <laughs> later on, and I ugly laughed. I think that was one of the best lines in the film, I'm not kidding. He doesn't get to glide in the movie though. Like, he's super strong and he can run pretty fast and he can climb walls, I'll be uh, very slowly. But he doesn't get to glide, and a part of me feels they're gonna wait until the next movie uh, to give us that next wow moment. I think performances across the board were great. Ben Schwartz's Sonic is just as good here than last time. Uh, Colleen is Tails. I mean, she had plenty of time to hone her craft thanks to Sonic Boom, so didn't have much to improve, if at all. She's great as Tails here. Uh, James Marston, Tika Sumter, and all the other humans, you know, they're fine. With what they're given for how insignificant I feel it is, I still think they did a good job. I swear the gun commander, though, he was the Olive Garden dude from the last movie. This movie will not let you forget about that. But if this movie were made like 20, 30 years ago, back in the 90s, you could convince me that the original casting choice of this dude would be Leslie. Nielsen and I'd buy that in a fucking heartbeat. His performance, even for this film, is so whimsy. Like he's a parody of a military commander. You'd see it in a Nickelodeon sketch, like in all that, or maybe the Amanda show. Like if like a Professor Pickle was the commander of gun, and I don't hate the character, but like even when you consider everything else this movie does, how crazy it gets, he somehow, some way, feels out of place. And I feel that's commendable, but it, it was uh, distracting. Jim Carrey as Robotnik, once again, a highlight. Uh, I don't think it's as memorable as before, though. Like, he's insane, a living cartoon. Jim Carrey, basically. But looking back, I think I might have enjoyed his performance a little more in the first movie. Later, though, when he gets supercharged thanks to the Master Emerald, I think that's where he's at his best. That sequence when he's describing how he feels in the coffee shop with the, the green energy effects and his auto-tune voice, that made me legit laugh. I like to think they didn't have to add much audio effects to Carrie's voice and that most of that was genuinely just coming out of his mouth. But back to the movie, Tails drops some exposition on us. Now, he is here because he wanted to warn Sonic that Knuckles is on his trail because he believes that Sonic knows the location of the Master Emerald, which in this continuity can turn thoughts into reality. An ancient relic that a long time ago, the Echidna tribe used to conquer the realm until the Owl tribe came along and said, hey, fuck, stop that shit. And they took the Master Emerald away to stop their tyranny. Here, the Master Emerald is actually all seven Chaos Emeralds combined into one. You know, I don't really mind that change. It's not gonna last long as we'll see later in this film, but I like the idea of of the, the big green emerald being the seven smaller emeralds combined into one. It's a small thing, but it's less clutter. It, it, it's less to keep track of when we're like hunting down MacGuffins as like the third or fourth or fifth one we will likely get involved with. A Sonic then remembers that the map that was given to him by Longclaw had a picture of the Master Emerald on it, but he never knew what it meant until now, so he didn't pay it any mind. And conveniently, the map then begins to start glowing and out pops a recorded hologram of Longclaw, who then tells Sonic that the Master Emerald is hidden on planet Earth and that he must first locate this magical compass to pinpoint its location. So with the power of Warp Ring, Sonic and Tails head to Siberia to locate the compass, but hot on their trail is Robotnik, Knuckles, and Agent Stone, who's been running the Mean Bean Coffee Shop until Robotnik made his return. And I don't know, man. Agent Stone really has a thing for Robotnik in this movie that, in my eyes, goes a little beyond platonic. Like, he crafts lattes with his and Robotnik's face close together, complete with little hearts. There's a scene later where he's giddy over picking Robotnik's new wardrobe. I caught the classic Robotnik costume in there, too. That was fun to see. 
are they gonna make Robotnik gay in this continuity? Like, I don't really care at the end of the day, it's not really important, but Stone really has an in for impressing Robotnik on a level that I don't think Snively ever reached. I don't think Snively ever really wanted to impress Robotnik, but uh, Scratch and Grounder, even Orbot and Cubot don't get this close, this infatuated with Robotnik. Hashtag make Robotnik gay. Let's get it trending, or don't, you stooge. Uh, Sonic and Tails head to Siberia and take refuge in a bar for the time because of bad weather. And they end up getting in the trouble because of uh, Tails' translator device, I guess, uh, uses like an old version of Google Translate and they end up insulting the patrons. So they're about to be thrown into the fireplace, but then Tails manages to say, I forget the word, but it convinces the Siberians to let Sonic and Tails compete in a dance-off so they have a chance to save their lives. And at first they get embarrassed big time. Like the human dancers go so hard and it was just uh, fun to see them in action. But then uh, Sonic and Tails start working together and they take the stage. Sonic whips out his iPhone to change the beat. This movie is brought to you by Apple and Chevy, by the by. And using Tails' inventions, they start dancing their asses off, making holographic copies, doing all sorts of things. It's a great spectacle, but it falls flat to me uh, in a couple of areas, and uh, I'm sorry for being that guy. For one, I think it's almost a repeat of the bar sequence from the first movie, only instead of like high-speed violence, it's dancing. I, I feel it's cheapened in that regard. It was because I kept thinking about that first bar sequence where it started to fall apart. A, a part of why Sonic and Tails don't just immediately leave the bar after almost dying is that they temporarily lose the map to the compass, but uh, they're constantly able to keep track of where it is in the bar, so I'm thinking, like, why doesn't Sonic just use his super speed to get the map and get Tails and himself the hell out of there. It's never considered, all for the sake of having this dance sequence, which again was a fun moment, a good trailer shot, but I don't think it was needed. However, to its credit, the end of this bar sequence gives me one of my favorite moments, and that's where Tails explains why Sonic is such a big deal to him. I gotta say, the Sonic and Tails dynamic in this movie is perfect. It is, in my eyes, uh, the best thing about this film. They changed it up a bit with Tails' origin like they did with Sonic, but not too much. He's still a kid that was made fun of because of his two tails, but instead of becoming friends with Sonic because he saw him run fast and he was able to keep up, and Sonic's like, yeah, you're, you're cool people. Tails here was inspired by Sonic, given his unusual nature. He's like, I have two tails, he's super fast, you know, it's okay to be weird. And Sonic, uh, knowing full well what that means, given the last movie, immediately relates to Tails, and that's where their friendship is locked in. It's beautiful. That is a great message to send to the kids. And afterwards, where Sonic and Tails crash for the night, uh, Sonic wraps Tails up in a blanket, and Tails uh, follows back by covering Sonic with his two tails. That was adorable. That That is Sonic and Tails right there. Perfect moment. So the next day, Sonic and Tails discover the location of the compass and manage to get it, but of course Robotnik was following the entire time, and with the help of Knuckles, they, they knock Tails unconscious, uh, Robotnik snags the compass for himself, and leaves Sonic to deal with an impending avalanche. But thanks to his trusty iPhone and that warp ring that he gave to Tom before he left to Hawaii, Sonic is saved in the nick of time, warped back to Hawaii, literally crashing Rachel's wedding. Uh, everything involving the wedding and its aftermath, unsurprisingly, ended up being the weakest part of the movie for me. I, I don't care for the majority of the human characters in this film. I care for Robotnik, I care a little for Agent Stone, maybe a bit for Tom and Maddie because, you know, they have the closest relationship to Sonic, but Maddie's sister, Rachel, her fiance, Randall, the wedding attendants, I don't care about these guys, and there's a bit of time spent on them. You know, it's to give the parents and the adults something to laugh at, but as an adult, I think anyway, I wasn't laughing. It falls so flat to me because these guys are not important. They only exist to lay the groundwork for more world building. And in that way, uh, it's fine because it turns out the entire wedding was a farce, a part of Operation Catfish, courtesy of the Guardian Units of Nations. Yeah, gun is now officially a thing in wake of Sonic and Robotnik's scuffle in the first movie. All right, I, I can dig that. Their goal was to eventually apprehend Sonic and take him into custody given his extraterrestrial status and the shenanigans he caused earlier in the uh, opening sequence of the film in Seattle with that whole bank robbery thing, the, the one they ended up fucking up. So yeah, that, that makes sense. Okay, but did they know Sonic was gonna suddenly crash the wedding via a warp ring? Like they have everything there at the wedding as if they were expecting Sonic to attend, but he didn't. So what would happen if they found out he wasn't there? And, and they had two cages as well. So they were also aware of Tails being a thing too. It's so confusing looking back. The wedding that Sonic didn't even initially attend was the setup? This needed another draft because it didn't make any more sense after two viewings. But even I have to admit Operation Catfish was a great name. That made me laugh. As well as everyone being in on it, whipping out their stun guns, including the priest who had a fucking gun inside the Bible. That was the that was the best thing to come out of that whole spiel. Sonic and Tails are eventually rescued thanks to Maddie and Rachel, and Sonic, feeling remorse for getting Tails injured, 
uh, makes a beeline for Robotnik all by himself, who has managed to uncover the hidden location of the Master Emerald thanks to the compass, and it's like this gargantuan temple that's in one part a reference to the Mystic Ruins in Sonic Adventure and Labyrinth Zone from Sonic 1. A good combination, I think, and it's like a triple whammy of set pieces here because you have Knuckles and Robotnik avoiding traps, one of them almost cutting Robotnik's dick off, and you got Sonic just speeding by the booby traps, avoiding them all together because that's what Sonic does. And then we get the Sonic and Knuckles a climactic encounter in the temple, with both characters looking very good here. It, it, visually, it's a satisfying clash of red and blue streaks. I think it's the best action piece of the film. Knuckles has Sonic on the ropes, but then Robotnik betrays Knuckles and takes the Master Emerald for himself, gaining ultimate power, uh, leaving the two to die as the temple collapses. Sonic, finally getting his genuine hero moment, manages to save Knuckles from drowning, who in turn saves Sonic from drowning because, well, Sonic can't swim. And this is where Sonic and Knuckles truly reconcile, Knuckles realizing uh, they're more alike than they think, something that was initially teased in their Siberian encounter. Knuckles hails from a tribe of Echidna warriors that threw their lives away against the Owl tribe in search of the Master Emerald. That's the reason why those Echidnas from the first movie were after Sonic and Longclaw, because they thought they knew the location of the Master Emerald. Good intel, they were spot on, but both the Echidna and the Owl tribe would die in the scuffle, leaving Knuckles and Sonic without a family, both of them growing up alone. And because of this uh, similarity, that is their bonding moment. And Sonic, you know, realizing that, is willing to let Knuckles into his family so that he can get another shot, you know, having a family and all that. And just in time, because back in Green Hills, Montana, Robotnik, now high off the Master Emerald, who I'm now calling Green Eggman and Ham, uses its power to construct, I think the instruction manual that Agent Stone refers to uh, calls it the Egg Robotnik, but it's the Death Egg Robot. It's a big fucking robot too, like it's the size of a skyscraper in this film, and like design wise it's fine, but I thought the CGI looked a little shoddy, particularly uh, when it starts moving, when it starts mimicking Robotnik's movements, and when Jim Carrey starts doing his Jim Carrey stick, I don't think the CGI matches up as well, but I don't think any CGI model could match Jim Carrey's rubbery movements, so that's more of a compliment for Jim Carrey. Sonic tells the Knuckles do what they can to stop the robot, but uh, nothing's working at first until the three decide to start working together as a team. What, that's Sonic Heroes, right? That's basically what it is. I was expecting some sort of direct Sonic Heroes reference. I was waiting for him to like jump up and do the poses, but uh, they didn't pull the trigger on that, so uh, that's maybe for next time. But they're basically Sonic Heroes, uh, each getting their moment in the sun. Uh, Tails shooting down egg pods with his blasters because, you know, flight formation had the thunder shoot. Uh, Knuckles brings the power, and he manages to knock the Master Emerald right out of Robotnik in a great callback to the beginning of Sonic 3. And Sonic, using the power of uh, top billing, uh, taps into the power of the Chaos Emeralds that were inside the Master Emerald, because uh, after the Master Emerald is knocked out of Robotnik, the Master Emerald starts breaking apart, and the Chaos Emeralds just kind of fall out, and uh, Sonic inadvertently like taps into that power when he's like on the verge of death. And then we get our Super Sonic moment. Sonic becomes Super Sonic, and visually, it, it looks great. Like th This translates really well to live action, and uh, he lays waste to the robot in no time at all, and it ends with a fucking Sonic 06 reference. <laughs> he gives the robot a love tap with his sneaker as the finishing blow. And I love Robotnik's retort afterwards, like, oh, it's like that. And I was like, yeah, motherfucker, they reference Sonic 06. And quite deliciously, I might add. And that's that. Robotnik uh, presumably falls to his death. Yeah, okay. The day is saved, and we end on Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles playing a game of baseball together. Sonic no longer having to play by himself, that pathetic fuck. But we do have a post credit scene, and I'm warning you now, if you still haven't seen the movie yet, but are somehow still watching this video for whatever reason, I'm telling you now, I'm about to drop a bombshell, and uh, hopefully you managed to avoid it, because this was all over Twitter like day one of its release, because Sonic fans can't keep their fucking mouth shut. With Robotnik presumed dead, Gunn has started doing a cleanup of Robotnik's old databases, and while digging through some of his files, they I find info on a project abandoned 50 years ago. The gun commander immediately recognizing what it is, Project Shadow. We end with the close-up of Shadow the Hedgehog suddenly waking up from his long slumber. Holy shit, they're immediately jumping the gun to Sonic Adventure 2. Shadow the Hedgehog, that's our next villain. So, okay, we're gonna we have the Space Colony arc. Uh, we're gonna see a child murdered. And, oh my god, please, please, let me see an old man die via firing squad. Please, Please leave that shit in. Shake these kids to the fucking core. Like, this is the real one, motherfuckers. I thought the next villain might be Metal Sonic because uh, to go back to Sun S at the beginning of the video, that quill, that Sonic quill that Robotnik had in the beginning of the movie, that shit vanishes without a trace. And I thought, oh, maybe later on, it'll be revealed to be the, the new power source for this universe is Metal Sonic. But uh, that's not what happens. I mean, it could happen. Maybe in the next movie, Metal Sonic is the ultimate villain that Sonic and Shadow will need to team up to stop together and not the bio lizard. You know, that's something we have to keep in mind with these these movies. They're not 
direct adaptations of the source material. They're clearly doing their own thing. So I think it's best that if we leave our mind open for these sorts of things so that we're not like ultimately disappointed with what they end up going. Now, would I mind seeing the Bio Lizard in the next movie? I mean, I could take it or leave it. The Bio Lizard in like Sonic Adventure 2 was always something that just kind of showed up to give like the characters a final boss to face. It's referenced one time, but I didn't think there was that much of a connection there. I'd rather it be someone that has more of a connection to Sonic and the cast like uh, closely. That's why I think Metal Sonic would be uh, a better villain, but I, I take it or leave it again, like I said. Uh, but we'll, we have to wait and see because that this, this movie's not for like another couple of years. The audience in the LA premiere popped off so hard when Shadow was revealed. I gotta say, it was really fun. Uh, seeing this movie in LA with a bunch of other Sonic fans because they cheered for every little thing, all the action pieces. Uh, dude, Colleen O'Shaughnessy, the voice of Tails, got one of the biggest cheers when her name showed up in the credits. And like, she wasn't top bill, but you think she was. And I like to think that just goes to show the kind of respect that the fans have for her. It was sweet. Uh, it was altogether really fun. It was energetic. It gave my viewing experience a different level of excitement. My second viewing uh, back here in Georgia, it was a packed theater, a lot of kids too, but it was shockingly reserved. A few reactions here and there, but surprisingly quiet. Make of that what you will. I'd love to hear what your theater reactions were like, so uh, please tell me in the comments below. But yeah, Sonic 2 was a great time. I liked it a lot more than the first movie. Uh, the action pieces were on point. There was a lot of respect paid to the source material, uh, if not directly, then with a bunch of visual references that were constantly peppered throughout the film to see if you can spot them all. But at the same time, things were adapted to make them easier to digest and making characters more relatable, which I think they've been really good at with this film series. You know, it's not just a matter of making Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles look and act the part, but they're given dimension, and characters with dimension our characters I can give a shit about. Since the next movie is likely gonna borrow so much from Sonic Adventure 2, I can't say I hope there's less humans next time, but so please, all I ask, make me give a shit about them. Don't make them such an unneeded distraction that's just there to fill out the movie length. Uh, that wedding stuff was not easy to sit through both times. I'm hoping we see Rouge uh, as a secret gun agent. You know what, I would not be surprised if the next movie also introduced Amy Rose. And not so much as a love-stricken foil for Sonic, but as someone to give Rouge to someone to interact with or maybe fight with. Hollywood loves their cat fights. Maybe have her be an agent working under Rouge or something like that. Or maybe have her be her own thing. I gotta say, I hope Amy in this universe is not like the love drunk caricature that she is in the games. I want a more independent Amy. Not like the stereotypical girl boss, but capable. Uh, and we already got enough of that scorned woman shit in the movie with Rachel and that wedding and all. I don't want to see that kind of shit again. No, no, leave it there. No more of that. <laughs> but the movie's doing incredibly well. I mean, not even as a video game adaptation, just like in general, it's pulling in big numbers and they want to make a cinematic universe out of it. So uh, it looks like I'll be having plenty to talk about in the meantime. Hopefully, if I'm invited to the next premiere, uh, it won't be so painful on my wallet. But I want to thank you guys for stopping by. Listen to me talk Sonic 2 for a bit. I want to thank Paramount for inviting me to the premiere. Uh, it's definitely a highlight of 2022 for me. Like, I'm putting that ticket in the scrap album the first chance I get. And to all my friends and mutuals who I saw at the premiere, I hope you also had a great time. But I will see you guys in the next video. Uh, as always, thank you all for watching. Stay safe. Wash your hands. Fuck Spirit Airlines. Have yourself a fantastic night. And take care.